In 1812, one of history's greatest military leaders took a dagger to the heart of their own reputation. Before the invasion of Russia, Napoleon was perceived as an invincible leader of an invincible army. So potent was the military maestro, states across Europe band together in hope of defeating his Grand Armée, to no success. Yet, right when he could do no wrong, Napoleon's fetid command made a giant misstep. Welcome to History on Fleek. Today we look at Napoleon's invasion of Russia and why it failed. Napoleon Bonaparte had risen to the very fore of European history and legend before he invaded Russia. A famed figure, the first emperor of France had become regarded as one of the greatest military leaders in all of history. His leadership success in the Revolutionary Wars was the stuff of legend, believed to have led over 70 battles and losing less than 10. Napoleon initially rose to the First Consul of France in 1799, and with this office, revolutionized an unstable state. In 1804, he ascended to Emperor of France with a stabilized economy, a proficient governing bureaucracy, and most importantly, a superlative army. Often declared a military genius, his most famous military victory was over the Austro-Russian forces at Austerlitz in December 1805. It's understood Napoleon's army was little more than 7,000 troops, defeating a force of 25,000. Napoleon had inherited a France in near constant conflict with various European states following the French Revolution. Across the opening of the 19th century, Napoleon led France in the Napoleonic Wars with much success. The War of the Third Coalition from 1803 to 1806 saw off the Holy Roman Empire after 1,000 years, no less. By 1812, the French Empire covered most of the European continent, including the kingdoms of Spain, the Rhine, Italy, Denmark, Prussia, and the Empire of Austria. France found itself going to war with various states joined in coalitions in hopes of defeating this military behemoth. During this time of warring empires, numerous treaties were signed between states, all in hope of leveraging power. Napoleon signed the Treaty of Tilsit with Alexander I of Russia in 1807, with the intent of blockading the United Kingdom and forcing them to pursue peace. However, the treaty hit Russia hard, and they soon left after three years. Napoleon and an increasingly battle-worn army were left without any foreign policy to deal with the United Kingdom. In hindsight, in what appears to be a move of grandiosity or desperation, Napoleon declared war on Russia to bring it back into blockade against the United Kingdom. You gotta admit, that is some commitment to foreign policy, no? Napoleon's legend was built off his effective and staggering military noose. As a commander, Napoleon was tactically astute deploying utilitarian tactics, often defeating larger forces with smaller deployments. He would move his troops with precision and speed, often cutting off an enemy's supply lines or lines of retreat. He was renowned for his quick, flexible thinking in organizing battle, but perhaps most importantly for inspiring an army. Napoleon was for his charisma, giving his troops a pride and purpose to go into battle. Beginning on June 24, 1812, Napoleon began his invasion of Russia with some of the highest costs ever seen by military conflict. The invasion lasted little more than five months, yet the human casualties were astronomical. In a minute time frame for armed conflict, around one million lives were lost. Napoleon's forces had been used for short campaigns, easily accommodated with horseback and horse-drawn support. Success in Russia would have required technological advancements like the telegraph or railroads, inventions yet to be seen. It's understood Napoleon's forces were 615,000 strong at the invasion's start, yet barely over 100,000 survived, most starving, frostbitten, and broken. The invasion of Russia by Napoleon's Grand Armée was supposed to be an invasion by the greatest military force the continent had ever seen. 
the nearly half a million musket infantry and cavalry troops under Napoleon's command were, on paper, too much for the Russian army. However, the Russian Cossack forces retreated deeper into their homeland, as the French supply lines were stretched as never before. When the Grand Armée reached Smolensk, they already lost tens of thousands, and Smolensk was razed through the artillery raining down from both armies. Napoleon had not gained a supply base, and the Russian army disappeared deeper into Russia. In Borodino, less than 100 miles from Moscow, a fearsome bloody artillery battle took place against the Cossack forces in entrenched positions defending routes to Moscow. Napoleon took the town, but once again, no defeat of Russian forces and no supply base. Upon arriving in Moscow, there was hardly a Moscow left but raised buildings. Napoleon had no captured capital to barter with the Tsar. Within a month, a grand infantry and cavalry were reduced to a few in a burning capital of little consequence and on a painful retreat to France. Napoleon's invasion failed on several significant accounts. The first being that he found out Russia had an entirely lacking network of roads. This meant the advance across the Niemen was very limited in terms of where Napoleon could place his forces. Secondly, Napoleon somehow envisaged he would force confrontation and conclude the invasion in 20 days. Yep, just 20 days to take down one of the largest geopolitical masses on Earth. This meant the supply wagons brought had just 30 days worth of supplies. Napoleon's plan B for this supply shortage was that his forces, men and horses, would have to live off the land as they went. Thirdly, just to throw a spanner in the works, Russian forces were scorching earth in every location they left and retreated. There was no land to live off of. In just a month, of the 50,000 horses brought for the invasion, 10,000 had died. To compound this, as soldiers got weaker and underfed during arduous military deployment, disease became rife, with typhus and dysentery spreading throughout his army. At the time of reaching Moscow, three months into the invasion's five, 200,000 men were dead or in hospital from illness. Finally, for those of you who haven't heard, history likes to repeat itself. Napoleon found, as many invading forces have found crusading east, Russian winter is not for the light of heart. Or as Russians have been known to characterize, Russian winter protects Russians. The Napoleonic forces were weak and exhausted before the weather turned. Following its brutal drop to well below zero, thousands upon thousands died in their sleep of exposure and their previous exhaustion. As you might guess, the bruising defeat in Russia shattered the mystique of Napoleon the military genius. His Grand Armée had seen off multiple threats from coalitions all over Europe. The failure east was welcomed by all rival nations. Europe was no longer seen as dominated by the French, but up for the taking from an army demoralized and a leader with waning authority. A year following the failed invasion, the War of the Sixth Coalition started in 1813. Numerous European states, including Russia, Prussia, Portugal, Spain, Sweden, and the United Kingdom, soundly defeated the French in a series of battles. Having been driven out of Germany and with Paris under occupation, Napoleon was on the run and exiled to the island of Elba, the island of Tuscany in 1814. Napoleon's demise as the preeminent leader in Europe was cemented by his exile to Elba. He even attempted suicide before setting sail to the island, but was not successful. At this point, Napoleon seemed in total denial of his fate, despite being declared an outlaw by the Congress of Vienna in March of 1815, as well as progressively seen by Europe as the only obstacle to the continent finding peace. Whether it was megalomania, denial, or a patriotism out of check, Napoleon escaped Elba and returned to France in early 1815, soon assembling another army. Arriving in Paris in March, Napoleon ruled over France for what would be his last 100 days of rule. Gathering a force of some 200,000, Napoleon marched his army into modern-day Belgium to battle British and Prussian forces on the attack. On June 18, 1815, the Battle of Waterloo commenced, and in a little under a month, the two coalition armies defeated what was Napoleon's last dance. 
Just four days later, Napoleon had abdicated in a sea of infamy, having lost legislative and public backing. The sun had set on the French Empire, and the continent would find peace for about a hundred years-ish. Much had been written on Napoleon's psyche, and we truly can't know. Retrospect suggests that his final return for the Hundred Days of War was ego-driven. It stood to do more damage than good, and his chances of military success were slim. Whether Napoleon considered himself invincible is a nearly unanswerable question. Whether he was addicted to the adrenal blaze of battle and the power his emperorship had afforded him may be a more prescient question. It should also be stated that come the invasion of Russia in 1812, Napoleon was suffering from health problems that were not exclusively physical. Could this military great have been suffering from mental health maladies? He wouldn't be the first. The Napoleon Complex is a derogatory stereotype of short men. Its title was earned by the British print press, characterizing Napoleon's conquering as compensation for his lack of physical height. In 1803, newspapers from Britain depict him as a short man with an even shorter temper. From this characterization, the stereotype grew and in modern terms has become known as small man syndrome. A shorter, aggressive male, often socially intimidating to make up for what they lack in height. Did Napoleon become a great military leader to make up for being short? Probably not. Did he invade Russia because the little guy didn't know when he was being beaten? It might have helped, if you believe the stereotype. This is History on Fleek, and we'll see you next time.